Just when I was jamming out to that music. Bonjour, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Kristen. I have the sincere pleasure of welcoming everyone tonight to, to our session where we're going to be talking all things women's health. And I'm joined by a wonderful, beautiful, strong panel, very well credentialed, very well experienced, clinically speaking, women here who are going to help me have conversations with you all around female health. Um, as a woman and also as a practitioner, this is something I, I get very um, enlivened and impassioned about for a multitude of reasons, personal, obviously, I'm, I'm here identifying as a woman and I navigate my health as a woman, but separately, I think there's a lot of confusion that can percolate up about our healthcare, in part because we don't necessarily have conversations um, around a lot of female health topics. We also, um, by and large, medicine science hasn't done right by us in that we're only now coming into this awareness of we need to properly, specifically, focusedly, intelligently study females and their health. And I think all these sorts of things, the social, the science, all the glory, um, contributes to this not always being a clear-cut path or an easy path. And um, part of the DNA company, what we're doing, we really focus on personalized health right? We dig so deep as to go into the genome and understand how the genome focuses and supports and curates your health and your care, but we want to go a step beyond that too, right? Really understanding the person that is before us and how do we best support them and what their health goals are. And so we'd love to know a bit more about you. We want to make sure that this conversation is as interactive as possible. As I continue on through this little introduction, there is a poll and I really encourage people to fill it out because we'd love to know what point of life you're coming to us at so that we can better speak to you, cater to you. Okay, we'll be closing that. We'll share the we'll share the results eventually too. So so we all within this group of our I don't know, 200 plus new closest friends <laughs> are able to understand who sits with us here. And before I introduce my panel of illustrious women, um, I do want to really echo that this is going to be a safe space for females, for women to be discussing their health. And I know often we hear safe space and a negative commentation in the sense of, oh, let's let's share the less savory or the more difficult or traumatic aspects. Let's have a safe space for that. But I also really, really, really want to encourage safe space also means a space for curiosity. You know, asking the questions that maybe you're a little bit embarrassed to ask someone else. So I'll, I'll offer one funny, ridiculous question. So for example, some people will come to me and say, hey, just before my period or just at my period, I poop a lot more. What's up with that? We want to make sure that, you know, the safe space is absolutely for sharing some stories that are a bit more tricky, but also we allow for the fun and the creative and the beautiful. There's there's many shades that go, go into being a woman to being a female. And so we want to hold and honor all of that because as we all know, it's not, it's not all sad news. There's a lot of joy, a lot of dance, a lot of wonder in our experience within the world. So please safe space does mean we're gonna hold space for the tricky, but we also wanna hold space and explore for the fun. Um, I know as I'm, I'm looking into the chat and again, please engage with us. So I'm looking into the chat. I know we're getting a lot of different people here. Um, a large majority are going to be women, but I wanna make sure we, we honor and at least give a shout out to men that are present who are curious for themselves, who are curious for their partner, their children, their nieces, whoever it might be. Welcome, thank you. You are just as welcome to ask questions here and to learn. We value that you're trying to learn. And just also a call out, largely today, because we are a genetic focused company, we are going to be talking about female health. So biologic sex XX health. This is not to exclude our friends in the trans community, just awareness that there are different health parameters and consideration that go into that. And so we want to make sure we're transparent in what we're talking here and that we can um, better support you and uh, different forms. Okay. We want to make sure just that everyone's welcome and aware of how we're supporting this today. So 
with no, with very little left ado, I want to start introducing our panel. We are together today for approximately 90 minutes, give or take some time. Um, during this entire time, we are going to have the question and answer window open. So that being a space, if you have a question like, why do I poop closer to my period? <laughs> That's where it can go. We'll make sure that we um, speak to that during our um, during the second part of this. So the first part of this uh, conversation is going to be us four ladies uh, introducing ourselves, giving some space to some health topics, things in particular that we see clinically speaking with women, with females, okay? And the second half is we're gonna dig into all those questions and answers. Um, and so expect that at around minute 40. Um, we're all in different time zones, so I'll say minute 40, okay? Um, and then again, please feel free to engage in the chat section. So often I'll be asking questions. I'm gonna leave you guys with the question before I start introducing our panel. Um, but anytime we ask a question or if you have further feedback, further thoughts, um, please do enter it into the chat. So while our panelists are introducing themselves, the question I will leave for you within the chat to please respond to is we're curious if anyone here is, um, taking or has taken um, forms of medication or nutraceuticals, uh, nutraceuticals that impact health, or sorry, that impact hormones. So for more of the pharmaceutical side of things, this could be oral contraception, this could be cervically, um, that being oral, sorry, or cervically inserted. Um, this could also be hormone replacement therapy, be it bioidentical, that's oral, topical, please toss in the chat what you're doing there. This could also be nutraceutical. We know that herbs and plant friends also um, have influence there. So please do let us know. And so with no further ado, I'm going to invite our wonderful panel um, to present themselves on the screen. And we are gonna take a moment to introduce each of ourselves. So I'll let those people pop up as I'm introducing myself. So my name is Dr. Krista Kostroman. I'm licensed as a naturopath up here in the wonderful Canada. Um, in Canada. My background is a little bit uh, eclectic insofar as I initially studied computer science. Um, my passion is systems. My passion is being professionally curious and trying to understand the world about me. And initially I went through that um, trying to create AI. And on that note, um, I do know that there's a few non-human friends in our um amongst us, namely we have some AI chat takers or note takers, sorry. And so if you are amongst the people that has an AI bot in here, well, I love that. And I aspire to be a cyborg one day. Today's chat is just for people. Um, so if you don't have DNA, unfortunately, we're gonna ask you to leave and just ask people with the chats to, or the chat bots or note taking bots, I guess, to, to, to leave or please the person stay, just not the bot, okay? Uh, so getting back to myself, yeah, background in computer science, but uh, I quickly recognized and learned that I was more curious about biologic systems and people. Um, I have a huge brain space and heart space for supporting health. Uh, so I went back to school for naturopathy, which for some people doesn't make sense. To me, it's, you know, a deep dive and an understanding of the human body, the human mind. So it makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm very, very fortunate here at the DNA Company to be our chief scientific officer, chief nerd. And I get to use all of my skills, both in the computer science space as to how we analyze data, how we analyze genes, how we extract from that and make sense of it to the more clinical side as a naturopath, as someone really focused on preventative medicine and saying with this beautiful wealth of information that we have tucked into our DNA, how do we enable and liven it so that we're focused more on the benefits, the health giving elements of our DNA and preventing some of the less savory stuff. So I'm fortunate I run our science, our clinic and have a clinical practice as well here. Um, 
to that end, I'm going to offer all um, the other three wonderful women on the screen with me here opportunity to introduce themselves. I'm going to very arbitrarily pick who goes first and we'll work around the clock. Um, and so I'm going to start with Dr. Varden. So please introduce yourself, how you're credentialed, how long you've been with the DNA company, and what makes you most excited for being here today to chat all things women's health with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Christ. I really appreciate that. And I want to extend my appreciation to all of you here tonight, taking time out of your day to join us, to learn, to be curious, to ask those questions and to share information. Uh, and definitely for those males out there that are supporting the females and in their lives. So important that you have knowledge of what's going on, you know, with all of us that so that way we can make a happier connection, better relationships. So my appreciation for your being here tonight. And uh, as Dr. Christo was saying, my name is Dr. Laura Varden. I am a PhD scientist. Uh, I have specialties in cellular biology, genetics, biochemistry, and neuroscience. Um, I'm also an educator. Um, I'm a board certified holistic health practitioner, licensed ecclesiastical holistic practitioner. I'm also a certified functional genomics practitioner and a certified functional nutrition and lifestyle counselor. I'm also an adjunct professor at the Department of Biology at Clarkson University, having taught anatomy and physiology to both undergraduate and graduate students. So really love diving into that, you know, working in the cadaver lab and, and really <laughs> learning about the body, you know, and all the beauty and just amazing things that we have to work with uh, and what we are living in. It's, it's just a beautiful, such an interesting thing. So I've been an in-house clinician with the DNA company for the last year and a half, and I educate people on their DNA, empowering them in their health transformational journeys, focusing on that trifecta of mind, body, spirit, really getting back to basics, as well as incorporating strategies for longevity and healthy aging and everything in between. I believe in the body's ability of self-healing. We just need to reconnect with it. We need to listen to our bodies and provide it the tools it needs to heal. And that can go from having a spiritual connection, that being in touch with something greater than yourself, being in touch with the breath, being in touch with and giving it the nutrients it needs, to have that healing capacity. So a little bit about being here and the importance of it for me. Um, there is a personal aspect to this being female. Um, <laughs> in my female health journey, I currently reside in the land of perimenopause. And it is one of those things where, you know, navigating it has been very interesting. As a scientist, I really like to step into that N of one. I am my own science experiment. And I love to test and to play and to see, oh, what is this going to do? And how does this work? And um, I actually have had a pretty easy time uh, with my perimenopause so far. I mean, granted, I do have some hot flashes, but they're pretty mild. Um, I'm not taking any hormone replacement therapy. Uh, years ago, you know, I did uh, take birth control um, for a very short period of time because my cycles were very irregular. I used to have terrible migraines, very heavy bleeding, and that since I have, you know, learned about my DNA and my particular hormone profile as estrogen dominant, it is mm -hmm. making sense of why, you know, I've had the time that I've had mm -hmm. also the fact of stepping into healthier living that has allowed me to have an easier transition. So really, this is the time for us to all be curious and start seeing and looking into our own journeys. So I'd like to thank you very much. 
and hand the mic over to one of my other illustrious, beautiful women. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Dr. Lara. In particular, thank you for very candidly and plainly and wonderfully sharing where you're at in your own personal health. Um, I, that's valued by me and it will be valued by uh, our audience, I'm sure. I'm going to pass the mic to our, our um, Dr. Stephanie. If you want to introduce yourself, let us know how you got here. Let us know where you are in your journey, because I know you're open to sharing that. Absolutely. Well, I'm excited that so many people are here tonight, and I'm excited to see all the comments in the chat. It's really great when you guys interact with us, because this really helps us personalize it for you. And I see a lot of you that are in the period where I am. So I have a Wow. Dr. Dragan Pharmacy. I have a board certification in clinical nutrition, and I had a private practice in Southern California for over 25 years that was all done on biochemistry and personalized um, medicine. So the neat thing is a lot of what we can do is going to be based on diet and lifestyle. And that's what we really want to personalize. Take your DNA, do, you know, lifestyle type medicine, but I like to back it with science. I worked in pharma for 10 years. I am a published author and did a bunch of pharmaceutical studies until I decided that that was not really where I wanted to be. And I see a lot of questions about cancer. I had cancer at 21 and it was cervical cancer. So I can tell you that that is really a personal spot when we talk about hormones. I was on birth control pills for a number of years. I was told I would never have children. I did have children. I had two live births um, and they're amazing. And then I am in my 60s and I am on bioidenticals. And so we will address the cancer issue later. We will address you know, oral versus pellets versus, oh, I see some other people that said they've mm -hmm. had. Okay. So we do want to talk about tonight's going to be a lot about de detox, a lot about what does your DNA say that gives you a peek inside the house and then things you can do to follow up. And we have an amazing functional medicine practitioner with us who can also talk about that. So, you know, we're excited you're here. We're excited that each one of our journeys is a little different, but it will wrap you in. And I just thank you for continuing to interact with us so that we can serve you. Yeah, thank you. I like that stage setting. And I'm going to pass the mic now to Betty. Betty, welcome. Welcome. You're a relatively new face with us. So thank you for joining us. Can you introduce yourselves to our audience? So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So I have to say when Dr. Kosterman and I got a chance to meet in person, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many similarities in our world. Um, I came to this industry through a very circuitous route. So I too was in IT. I love problem solving anything technical. I was like, I, I, I did nutrition exercise, those things on the side. And actually it was my own illness, much like a lot of us that come to this arena, we come to it from our own illness. And for me, it was digestive. Uh, I you know, had episodic things when I was younger and as a teen and you, know, you get into your twenties and you kind of blow those things off until it becomes really bad. And you know, in my late twenties, I was diagnosed with colitis. And to me, as I moved into my 20s and 30s, it was, okay, you're going to go on these drugs. And if anybody's had an autoimmune disease, they're pretty intense drugs. And I just couldn't, I thought I asked what was a very normal question, which was, could I change my diet and change the trajectory of my digestive disorder that's autoimmune? And the doctor, I remember it so distinctly, he barked this gigantic laugh in my face and said, it has nothing to do with what you eat. So I had some choice things to say for him as a very um, boisterous, outspoken female. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided at that moment, I was going to go back and understand nutrition at a much deeper biochemist biochemistry level. So while working 80 hours a week, I went back to school full time, went back into a master's program in, in human nutrition science, even went and got a health coaching certification. So I was like, I need to know what to do to help people understand the chemistry when they're probably crying on the couch about giving up whatever they're eating and those things, because I knew that I had that disconnect. And I got out and started my own private practice. I ended up opening one of the first um, integrative functional clinics in North Texas, joined the Institute for Functional Medicine, and I became one of the first 300 worldwide certified as a functional medicine practitioner through IFM. But when I hit 39, all <laughs> kinds of stuff hit the fan. <laughs> 
And, you know, I can connect the dots now. I was actually on the study in my mid-20s that uh, that uh, approved Zoloft as Seraphirm for PMDD. Mm. Not realizing at the time it was the birth control that I was on that was just making yeah. my mental health a mess. Like I, hindsight, I'm like, oh, that was very interesting. I was terrified. I didn't want to get pregnant. And so, you know, when I got into my late thirties, I got off the pill and everything went wrong. It was, I went into early perimenopause at the time I was in functional medicine, but I was like, that can't be it. That can't mm-hmm. be it. And I was a very early taker to genetics. Whenever it was first available, I started genetic testing. I've had my entire genome sequenced. I've done every genetic test. And what became abundantly clear was I had a lot going on in my detox pathways and particularly in the estrogen pathways. And, you know, through that process, I was able to do a lot to correct my health. And when I went into menopause, so I'm 54 going on 55 this year, I went into menopause and I have had zero hot flashes, no night sweats, but I can tell you from 39 to 47, it was not pretty. And the reality is that's what also drove me back to get my PhD. I wanted to number one, understand it at a deeper level and you really need access to the studies and find out where the gigantic gaps are and there are gigantic gaps there and number two in my clinic i had the ability along with people like the dna company to capture a lot of data and contribute to women's health but i needed to become a a, basically a method expert and a a (laughs) research expert so i went back and my studies have actually been primarily in hormone metabolism the microbes in the gut And then specifically, I also went deeper in looking at IBS in women. And so Mm -hmm. this is my passion. I even have a podcast called Menopause Mastery. So for those of you that are in our camp or on your way, we talk about this science every single week. Um, I I am so passionate about this. I was like, how can I get on a political stage and talk about it? (laughs) So I probably get thrown off stage, but I try it. I love it. Well, here's your platform, Adele. Here's the platform to be to be sharing in a space where people want to hear it and people are ready to receive it. And I'm quite odd, not necessarily in a positive way, but odd by the reality that everyone around here to an extent has partially come to their medicine practice because there was an issue. They went to a doctor and the doctor's like, it's because you're a woman. Here's the pill. Good luck. (laughs) This kind of like just blanket statement, this one size fits all that we individually know is not true, but this very much inspired all of our practices, absolutely all of our practices. And so talk to me a little bit, you know, each of us here are clinicians, each of us here see patients, right? We see, we see females coming to us with this I think I might be going crazy. And the doctor tells me I probably am and have prescribed an antidepressant, but I want to try something else first. Talk to me a little bit about the experience of receiving women, different stages of their life. You know, I'm looking at this survey. We have a beautiful spectrum here, a little bit more weighted in around perimenopause and menopause, but um, very heavily weighted around menopause. But um we still have a wonderful segment of people, including people who don't yet have their, their period. And so speak to us a little bit on your clinical experience of receiving women in different stages of life and, and the space that must be created to ensure they understand they're not crazy. Because <laughs> hysteria, right? Like that's, that's what women are often called, just hysterical. She's being hysterical. Her uterus is running around her body. <laughs> yeah, anyone, any thoughts there? I can speak up to that. I think, you know, as somebody that runs a really large clinic as the CEO, and and I still still see people, I think one of the most valuable and one of the least used things in medicine is just listening. It is, it is being present and being in the space of I'm curious and also compassionate and empathetic, and I'm here with you and I need to hear your story. You know, conventional medicine cuts somebody off in an average of seven seconds, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't, you can't do that. And I think as women, it's dismissive and it happens. And I think we, we get it more, but I think just Mm -hmm. being able to sit and be present and let somebody tell their story. I hear it all the time that people go, oh gosh, I feel like I'm in my therapist office. I don't think I could probably shouldn't tell you that. I'm like, feel free to tell me whatever you want to. It's Mm -hmm. within these walls. Right. But I think there's there's such a cathartic experience for somebody to just hear you, right? Mm-hmm. 
And I think, I think at, at the very minimum that should be there. And then obviously validate and give hope, right? And be curious. I think if and somebody's- And I think adding details, the fact that we ask very specific details. So I was with someone yesterday, how's your sleep? Well, it's generally good. Well, <laughs> what does that mean? Do you fall asleep easy? Do you stay asleep? Do you get up? Do you have an hour or two every night? And, and there was this deer in the headlight look because I think oftentimes we check out, we've gotten so used to our symptoms. Yeah. We've gotten so used to being shut down by a lot of healthcare, uh, which is really sick care and they want a symptom stomp where like Betty and like Lara, you know, we're working on the biochemistry. We want to look at not, we don't have a cardiac system and a gyno system and a, <laughs> you know, neurology. They all work together. And so we've got the DNA, which is this shell. It's kind of like looking at a house, but then you don't know, let's say you live in a community where there's planned houses. Okay, you know, this is a three bedroom, two bath. You know, this is a two bedroom, one bath, but is it done minimalist inside? Is it done country? Is it furnished? Is it not furnished? Your shell is your DNA, but how are you decorating? And, and like Betty, so when I was diagnosed with my cancer, they wanted to do bone marrow transplant. They wanted to have me grow in the plastic bubble for three months. It would have been a million dollars of medical debt. And at mm -hmm. 21, I'm like, do I have any other options? Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I had an East Indian physician who said, you don't need all these drugs. You need to change your diet. But I said, how do I do that? And yeah. this is what I got go find some little nutritionist. <laughs> this is what I remembered. Okay. No, so no. I did exactly what I was told. I found a little nutritionist. She was four foot 11. She was 82 years old. She kicked <laughs> my butt and saved my life because she listened because she understood the biochemistry. Now she didn't have the DNA. So she couldn't tell me I was a hidden celiac, but she knew how to get out. So what we want to offer you is when you know your DNA, and whether you dig in yourself or whether you work with a practitioner that heals back, part of what we're going to do is we don't think you're crazy. We know it's real. And yes, right before my period, I do poop more. And I used to say to my male gynecologist, <laughs> why am I pooping like two days yeah. before I start? And he goes, it's all in your head. It doesn't happen. Well, I mm. learned about the prostaglandins and the release of prostaglandins. And, and I... Here this was, this man who had had 16 years of education telling me I was crazy, but he'd never had it because he didn't have a cycle. So sorry, dude, you were wrong. Um, and they're not all like that. But, you know, on the other hand, it is good to be heard and it is good to be acknowledged. And do we know everything? We don't. But are we willing to hear everything and search for an answer? And so yesterday when I had someone tell me I have no sugar in my diet, but mm -hmm. I eat oatmeal and berries every day right. and I have ramen most days, though it's homemade, you know, and, you know, and we talked about starches and how they break down and cortisol and the late night snacks that, you know, were fresh fruit, but a fruit is sugar. And when we were looking at all that, all of a sudden she had all these ahas come on based on her DNA, based on her diet, based on her lifestyle where she was really empowered to make some powerful changes that mm -hmm. could just help her sleep better, help her have more energy, help her live a more vital life. And that's it's so important. So important. Ooh, very important. I want to, I want to remind people, all of us here, not just the people in the audience, but the four of us, you know, speaking here tonight, that when you are in your doctor's office, there are always two experts in the room. One of those experts is you. You can't be your own expert though if you don't do your own inquiry. Getting in touch with yourself, being curious, you know, finding out what what was going on in your life, why, you know, what was happening when certain things started. Okay, what were these antecedents? What are these triggers? You know, finding out and again, getting in touch with yourself, but don't ever hand over all of your agency to another person. 
You don't have to know all the answers of what to do, but you mm-hmm. do get to have the answers of who you are. And this is really important because you want to take it from, oh, why me? To, oh, me. Oh, that's mm-hmm. what happened in my life. Oh, mm-hmm. that that's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. That got worse when I was going through a divorce or when I was in grad school or when my parent passed away. Okay. Breaking it down and then going back and connecting those dots, figuring out those antecedents, looking at what the triggers are, being able to tell that story is very beneficial, especially when it comes to being able to intelligently and with authority being an advocate for your own health when you are in front of a healthcare provider. You know, separating out your signs from the symptoms and the diagnoses are very helpful when it comes to communicating with conventional medical practitioners. And so you're probably going, okay, well, what's the difference? Well, symptoms is something we experience that cannot be measured. For example, I feel fatigue, okay? Where a sign is something that can be measured. Like even if you're in a coma, signs are still there. Like you have a rash, you have a fever, increased heart rate, things like that. And of course, diagnoses are diagnoses from you know what the doctors determine. Mm-hmm. But really being in charge and taking that authority upon yourself and being an yeah. advocate, finding that voice. Yeah, I love that thought. And I think throughout the course of my practice, that's something that I had to, to learn in particular with women. So I've been practicing for about eight years and um, I jumped right into the complex cases. I like the I like the tricky stuff. I like rolling around in the mud. And I, I started with a lot of people who are experiencing chronic illness, meaning they've been, they're pretty sick and they've been sick for quite a while. That could be cancer, that could be chronic fatigue, that could be fibromyalgia. There's a few different that fall in that bucket, Lyme, et cetera. And I learned quickly as I was listening to those stories that oftentimes the person before me forgot their story. They tell, had told so many different practitioners in trying to figure out what was going on. And they'd rehearse this to a point where it was almost a script to them. And they'd almost didn't know their symptoms anymore because they'd been repeating the same story for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, whatever it might be. And it was a lot of the curious questions that would break them out of that, that would remind them they're not a script, that every day this changes. And there was a little bit of sadness within me and, and for the medical community as a whole that I noticed women to an extent would come to me with the same scripted story because they'd offered this so many times and they'd been told by various practitioners, often male medical doctors, but definitely sometimes female medical doctors or other practitioners of, uh, this isn't part of what I do, don't worry about it, go away, you know, in, in some form or fashion. And so I think to everyone's point here as we went through this table, reminding ourselves not only are we the advocate, and the person, as Betty says, must scream loudest <laughs> within that appointment, but also to continually be your own expert, to continually touch base with your own, um, with what is going on in your body. So you can bring forward best information that might inspire a different shift, right? If Dr. Stephanie hadn't said, what else can I do? That doctor may not have been inspired to say, well, here are the other options, right? It's, it's not fair that we as women need to be advocates within the clinical space, but it is what it is. And so we might as well learn to scream as loud as we can so that people can hear us. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, so I'm looking into the chat right now and I'm seeing such a wide variety. Thank you everyone who's who's chipped in such a wide variety of hormonal interventions. And um, all the way from kind of, I have a long history of birth control, which I imagine most women do because that was kind of the the cure-all pill to a lot of different forms of BHRT and HRT and and things like this. So I wonder, um, ladies before me, all of who have clinical experience um, supporting either HRT, BHRT, I wonder if we could start talking through that journey of when a person comes to you and says, hey, I'm thinking about this. 
how do you, what questions do you ask? What questions should people be asking their clinicians? Um, things things along that nature. And I think we'll we'll possibly continue the order we had. Maybe Betty, we start with you, and we'll kind of go around our circle. Yeah, I think you know. Uh... If you're a woman, I, I would say obviously uh, the vast majority are the perimenopausal or menopausal. It's not just about the estrogen and progesterone and testosterone that you make. It's about how your body wraps it up, gets it ready and exits it out of the body once it's done. And so, you know, I look at it when we're working with somebody and it's understanding you know, if you've had your genetics tested, we can have scenarios where we're all wired a little bit differently. So one woman's experience of their period may look the same. It's four days and it, I get cramps or not, but the mechanism and the activity of those hormones and how their body processes them can be different. So when you do talk to a practitioner, the more information you can give about your own personal experience, how far is it between your cycles? You know, what are your cycles like? How, are they heavy? Are they not? Are they scant? Do you have clotting? Do you have fibroids? You know, have you had at really abnormal periods or been diagnosed with PCOS? Because to the well-trained clinician, that starts our brains off on the patterns. Like we can start laying out the genetics mentally as you're talking, right? Uh, you know, it's it's we can start seeing that pattern play out. And so part of it is giving that information and then it's also, I think, because there's a lot of people out there giving giving out medications, right? There's a lot of people treating with hormones and there needs to be more because I saw a bunch in the chat that was like, you know, my doctor won't do it because they're still quoting the Women's Health Initiative, which I'm sure we could go into. Um, but I say the vast majority are not taking that extra step to understand what your genetics are, how you, how you are going to process those hormones. And then also checking, right? So one of the things that we always do is we look at how your hormones are being metabolized as we do treatment, because that helps us distinguish what else nutritionally, lifestyle, and all those other things that might be done. So I think it's also being empowered to say, what do you do to help me make sure I'm taking the right amount in the right place in the right way, and that my body's handling it in a way that is the most appropriate and most valuable. You know, I think so those are how do you approach? Do you like saliva? Do you like blood? Do you like let's talk there because I think I see a lot of people, some are on BHRT, some are on pellets, some are so I know what I like, but I'm interested to hear what you like and yeah. uh, see if we can give some guidance of if somebody was gonna start, where do you like to start? Yeah, so uh, so if we talk about the research, the research there is standardized levels that we look at in blood. Now, blood poses a huge problem because blood is both bound and free. So for everybody, the, the low tech way to understand this is your hormones have taxi cabs. When you get it in blood, you don't know which one got out of the cab or whether they're stuck in New York circling, right? So, so it's a quick and dirty way that it is what's most of the time used. So a lot of times people may look at hormones in the blood if you can get your doctor to do it. It's also cheaper and easier. If you look at it in the saliva, you're able to see what's free. Now, if you're taking things like oral progesterone, that's going to radically make that number look wildly off. So then it becomes harder to judge the true, you know, how much you have available. Personally, when I, when we're judging, you know, how are you metabolizing it? Do you have enough free hormone? What's really happening? I prefer urine. And the reason why is because urine shows free levels. It also shows your metabolites. So you can literally look at your DNA test and then <laughs> layer on top of it, your urine and see exactly how they match up. Mm -hmm. woo, woo, woo. I mean, I, 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 I have, you can listen. I am on my podcast. I, I played my DNA conversation with Kishi, right? So my, mm -hmm. he, he got him, I play it as a, as a podcast and he's like, whoa, you <laughs> had a really terrible estrogen. And I was like, yes, I know I do. Right. <laughs> so I can check I it. Right. <laughs> lay it on top. So, so that's part of the mechanism. What I will say, even about urine testing is there's a little bit of a black box there. There's parts of it that are not highly visible with the testing we have today, which means you have to have a clinician who knows how to read it in a way for those gaps, right? We have, think of it as two trash cans, one trash can, we can kind of see the other one we can't see very well. So you get it like to the garage, but you can't get it out the front door and through the garage and then to the curb. So when you when I look at it, those are the things that I think about. The delivery depends. I'm personally oral, no, because that has to go through the liver. Well, before and you go on, before you go on there, so I want to confirm 
that you mm-hmm. and I are on the exact same pattern. And I maybe it's because we have that functional nutrition kind of mm-hmm. support, but yeah. I want you to make sure that everybody heard that. So your, your, if you've got insurance, the insurance generally covers the blood. That's a great play to start, but you yeah. do want to do free and bound, like especially with testosterone and stuff so that the, the sex binding globulins hold it like the taxi cab, but you don't know who's getting off. Okay, so that is a great place to start to go. Am I in a functional level? Am I outside of a functional level? I agree. Saliva is not only very reasonably priced, but it also shows you what's available, what's getting into the tissues. Because it doesn't matter how much is in your blood. We got to know what's in your tissues. (laughs) And so when's your tissues, we can also see what's in your saliva and we can do. I think the biggest crime for all women is that we don't do annual urine metabolites because it doesn't matter how much you're putting in, it's where is it going and how much comes out? Why is a wellness check not an annual Dutch test? Because we've got to know. Western Mm -hmm. medicine is so good at killing stuff off and throwing (laughs) stuff in, but they don't clean up. I want you to think about your house. You take a bunch of stuff in your house. Pretty soon your house gets really crowded. There is no room. We call them hoarders, okay? We got to clear that out. So we got room to breathe and we got room to move and we've got room to to invite people over, okay? So we've got to make sure we're cleaning out as much or more than what we took in so that we've got space, so we can breathe, so that we can process. And if you're too cramped, you can't process, So if you took one thing away today, for me, it's going to be annual 24-hour urine Dutch test so you know where your metabolites are going so that your practitioner can help you go, oh, you're going down the wrong pathway. Because, I mean, both Laura or Betty, you can address this. So many people are afraid of hormones because of the genome test and because of the Women's Health Initiative, the cancer scare. And I hope we go into that at some point today because Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of misinformation about women's health and about that. But the one thing for me today is urine test, urine test, annual or at least (laughs) biannual so that you can really know where am I going? Where is my body driving it down? And then there's ways to manipulate that, whether it's with food or with supplements or with lifestyle so that you go drive down the healthy pathways and avoid the chronic disease. Yeah. Yeah. And, if I could and there is there is the that. Dutch test and then there is also a 24 hour urine. So you can do both that are both metabolites. I want to just clarify Dutch does diurnal like rhythm through the day and and then yep. you have a 24 hour both gets you to the answers just slightly different ways. Yeah. And if I can add to that, I would also advocate for with this annual testing, keeping your own records becoming a space with which you control and possess and maintain your health data. Because when you go to a practitioner, that wealth of data is really helpful to us. It shows that velocity, that history, where your body is, was, sorry, and where it is now. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Lara, I wonder if you could offer us what sort of health bio data do you love to see from people? I know, I know you personally, because we work together. I know you love doing Dutch tests. What other data do you love to collect, especially in the ends of let's keep this woman well? Uh, I love to look at um, things that they already have, their blood tests that can actually be a gold mine of, you know, what's going on, but that is just a glimmer of information. I still like getting back to the root, speaking with them, knowing who they are, what are their experiences, what is their life like right now, what is their stress levels, you know, what toxins have, are they currently or have been exposed to, because it all is important, everything is connected, and we are all unique, and the way that I like to look at it is not so much just jumping right into hormones and, you know, oh, should I be on this, you know, um, uh, this particular hormone replacement therapy and, and, oh, well, my genes have this and, and it's just like, okay, time out. And Mm -hmm. let's, first of all, what's the overall picture, you know, uh, asking them questions and then saying, okay, well, first of all, let's clear the muddy waters. Let's look at what the root causes are first. Let's control the controllables. 
So it's like three roots, many branches. Um, and when I say that branches, these are the signs, symptoms, and diagnoses that I was talking about. Like if you came upon a tree that the leaves were wilting and discolored, you wouldn't go over to that tree and pluck off the leaves or cut off the branches thinking that's going to make the tree beautiful. What we want to do is we want to start looking down the trunk, into the roots, and into the soil and saying, why is this tree, you know, having these issues? So it's the same types of things for people. I would look at the roots, their genes, their digestion, and their inflammation. Mm -hmm. Because when you're talking about genes, we look at, I look at the circle of influence. So the food, movement, environment, mindset, these epigenetic factors that influence our gene expression. In digestion, this is including the mechanical, chemical, structural, microbial, all the things that impact our digestion, metabolism, and nutrition. And then for inflammation, to clear, calm, enhance, and modulate, like clearing. Do you have to clear toxins? Do you have to clear negative mindsets? maybe heavy metals, infections, because all of these are going to impact your cortisol, your stress levels, which are part of your hormones and effectively, you know, estrogen, testosterone levels, your sleep, you know, mm -hmm. because from our last webinar that we did about sleep, testosterone is made while you sleep. And women, when you look at the absolute values, if you normalize your hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, if you normalize the values, we actually have more testosterone than we do estrogen, less than men, but still more, you know, in absolute values. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that regulation is very, very important. So I look at these things, these low hanging fruit, these basic, um, it, you know, aspects of roots mm -hmm. before we dive into all that, because if we can clean that up, it will make it more clear what type of hormone replacement is necessary. And when they do take it, it's more effective. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that amongst the four of us, there is incredible synergy as to let us get testing to understand where we are. Let us hear the story. And to Dr. Steph's point, let's also be mindful of some of the gaps within Western medicine. How do we clean house? How do we keep things squeaky clean? How do we get sleep to clean things up? How do we do diet to clean things up? And you know, I'm mindful that we invited our audience here to please submit questions. And so I wanna, I wanna maybe clumsily jump into that because we promised people about a 50-50 split and we're probably doing two thirds, one third. Um, but I would I I I wonder if I can offer on behalf of the four of us that we will return at a, a to be determined frequency, but maybe once a month. And I wonder if we can return to this beautiful little round table and if we can start engaging people a little bit more frequently, perhaps putting out a Facebook group so people can chat. I think there's a lot of, you know, it's, I listen to these conversations and to kind of all these little threads that I want to pull, pull further at with awareness that if I pull it one thread, it's going to unravel whole different webinars. So I wonder, I'm going to, I'm going to volunteer possibly. Um, and, and actually heads up, I already have agreement. I'm not volunteering anyone into anything they haven't said yes to already, but we will be back. So while I think this beautiful conversation needs to continue to be had, I want to make sure we're honoring the community that's joined us today. And we're going to start jumping into some questions. All right. So the first question that I have here, ladies, is from Heather. Uh, so Heather is wondering if you can be estrogen dominant during perimenopause and menopause. She's confused if you should look into bioidentical estrogen or estrogenic foods during this perimenopausal time. So perhaps what I'll start off with, I'm going to break that question down. Maybe Dr. Laura, if you want to address what she means by estrogen dominant, because I think we at DNA Company use that in a very specific way. And then perhaps between Dr. Steph or Betty, if you want to tackle that second part of the question as to how do you go about supporting that period of life, be it through food or through more intensive measures. 
Okay, so as far as what she's talking about with estrogen dominance, this is in our hormone reports. And really what we're looking at is the whole cascade, um, this biochemical uh, changes and reactions that happens when we start with pregnenolone and progesterone and changing it to testosterone and how quickly you do that. Um, the ways that testosterone, um, the, the pathways that it takes, how quickly is it cleared? How how well do you bind to the androgen receptors? How fast do you convert that testosterone to dihydrotestosterone? And then how quickly do you convert testosterone into estrogen, which is called aromatization? So looking at that spectrum and all of these different players, we can determine the dominance that you have. Basically, what hormones that you make. And you can either be balanced you can be a dominant, you could, and in that dominance, you could be estrogen dominant, you could be androgen dominant, you could be co-dominant. So that really depends on what your particular profile is. So for Heather, she is estrogen dominant. Now, genetically, that does not change no matter what um, part of this female journey that you're on, okay? Uh, that remains the same, but the way that it is expressed especially when it comes into uh, the metabolites that are made from the estrogen, because there are three main metabolites, your 2-hydroxy, 4-hydroxy, and 16-alpha-hydroxy estrones. And uh, the 4 and 16-alpha-hydroxy estrones are more inflammatory. So these are usually ones that are looked at during your Dutch test, depending on how many you are metabolizing. That is an indicator and something to look at when you take these tests. Uh, and, and this is something that Betty was referring to, laying her DNA on top of her Dutch test, saying, okay, you know, based on my genetics and what I'm actually seeing in my results, how is that reflective? And then what can I do, you know, to help uh, alleviate any of those metabolites that can be more inflammatory, things like DIM. And, you know, this is where we get into some of the um, herbals and, and pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Yeah. So- uh, that's really, you know, what we're, what we're talking about in hormone quality. Yeah. And, and my two other lovely ladies thoughts as to the, to do about it all. <laughs> I, mean, I can weigh in a little bit um, as somebody that was incredibly, my genetically I'm estrogen dominant and a really bad detoxer, let's just call it what it is. Right. So I was very estrogen dominant, right. Especially as I entered into perimenopause. However, you know, as you go through menopause and you lose some of that ovarian function because the hypothalamus pituitary changes and you also have, you know, think of it as your egg carton is empty, right? The impetus for your body to, to do anything more is empty. Here's what I found in my research, right? Because I was very curious about this because I was completely terrified of too much estrogen because I had all the negative side effects of that. But looking at it now after, you know, many years of research, also, when you go into that last part of perimenopause, when you're really embroaching onto that menopause status, what happens to our estrogen is it's not like a perfect, you know, flow every month like it used to be. I call it the ketchup bottle effect. So mm -hmm. when you're 20, your estrogen's like a perfect ketchup bottle. I don't do ketchup, but you know, you got the visual here. You squeeze it out and this is perfect S for most of us, right? Predictable, kind of works. You get into perimenopause and it's half empty. So you shake it and then you go <laughs> squeeze, squeeze and it's flat, right? So you get these really abnormal things, fibroids, all that other junk, right? Heart, heavy periods, all that. When you end up in menopause, it's doing that. But the other thing that, this is what I think, this is where there's big gaps in the research. Those of us who are dominant like that also have an incredible amount of receptors for it, right? Here's what I think, because I wouldn't touch estrogen until I hit menopause, like full on, nothing there, it's gone. And I think now, knowing what I know, had I started some estrogen replacement, because I was already doing Dutch tests, I was already checking because I knew I couldn't detox it. And, you know, when I tested, it was kind of all over the place. So I was like, oh, I've got to be dominant, right? But I think if I had actually put in a little bit of estrogen early before I had gone completely through, I think I would have been able to take out the heavy waves and valleys of my own body's activity. So what I would say to all of that is just because you're estrogen dominant doesn't mean you can't do estrogen in menopause, right? It doesn't and mean you can't I would agree with that. Estrogen. And I would ask you, how do you feel about estrogenic foods? or mm -hmm. supplementations that mimic estrogen? 
Absolutely. Now, absolutely. You know, even if you look at the cancer research, the whether it's the phytoestrogens and genistein or flax, they are they are weak estrogens that go in and slide in and sort of occupy that key space. And so you could absolutely they run into the slot. And they sit in the slot, kind of like when we had you know the music and we pull a chair out and pull it, but they sit in the slot. So the slots get full. Yeah. <laughs> And they occupy those receptors. So we can do things like estrogenic foods or supplementation that can help it. Not just, not just, you know, blocking some of the detox pathways, but actually amplifying natural ways to occupy those receptors. Absolutely. So I personally don't think having a dominant estrogen, you know, genetic keeps you from hormones. If anything, I think in some cases it's more profound. If you look at the research, it's, it, those are the people that are probably going to be more symptomatic right? As they go through menopause in a lot of cases. Which is why I think you can start with estrogenic foods, supplementation, get, you know, the lab work that we talked about, and then see if you need to go to, Mm -hmm. you know, a a more grade, but, but to understand the pathway now, which hopefully you're seeing a little bit more of the pathway, you see that you have options along the way, which I think is real helpful for people who want to tiptoe in. Now, the one caveat of that is Betty, like you, I'm estrogen dominant, but I'm a poor detoxer. So those of us who are poor detoxers, yeah, and a lot of us here are poor detoxers. So then we have the deal with plastics, okay? All the microplastics, (laughs) hormone disruptors. You know, Laura, I saw you with your, um, I'm guessing it's stainless steel or something, your water bottle, pull it up and show. I used to do water bottles, don't do water bottles anymore. Yeah, there we go. So I've got ceramic, okay? They've got steel. Get rid of your plastic water bottles. Get rid of the microplastics in your life because those are hormone disruptors. A lot of perfumes are hormone disruptors. A lot of creams for skincares and stuff are hormone disruptors. Yeah. You got to start looking for things that, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say ways that you can look into this to find out if the products you are using have chemicals that are these endocrine disruptors, visit uh, environmental working groups website, ewg.org. And they also give a list of wonderful products that are verified that are toxic free. So Mm -hmm. Definitely uh, take a look at that. You would be surprised at how many toxins are in your environment. Well, and I love that if we look at the chat right now, I see so many people between Bobby and and Mary and and Wendy that are like estrogen dominant poor detoxifier, <laughs> estrogen dominant poor detoxifier. So yeah. here we are. Here we've got this group, yeah. and we're like, okay, so how do I do this? Environmental work group is great. Go go natural. You know, is going to be a good step. But, but what does natural mean? Okay. And, mm-hmm. um, oh, and B just put in the uh, environmentalworkgroup.org. So that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that we're talking about, okay, it, it is okay to do that. And there's a way to tiptoe in. And again, you know, whether it's a Betty or whether it's a DNA co or, or whatever, there are people there that can say, oh, you've done your research, you know, when we were talking about being your own advocate, one of the things that Tony Robbins talks about is you, having a PhD in results doesn't mean you have a piece of paper. You have a PhD in you. Nobody knows you better than you do. So don't let anybody like the physician who told me I was just crazy when I had, you know, loose bowels the day before I saw women earlier saying loose bowels, migraine headaches, you know, and they could say, oh, I know my period's two days away because yeah. I did this. Yeah. When you look at cleaning up your diet, cleaning up your environment, cleaning up what you're putting in and on your body, know that anything you put on your body also gets put in your body. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried this. It sounds a little far out, but if you take garlic, break it open, rub it on the bottom of your foot. Within 30 seconds or so, you will taste garlic in your mouth. And you're like, the garlic was on the bottom of my foot. How in the world am I taking it in my mouth? It's because the skin absorbed it, took it into the bloodstream and put it up and it circulated everywhere. So every time ladies, and I'm assuming there's mainly ladies, but any of you, all right, people, you know, 
If you touch a little bleach on your hand, you think it doesn't matter. You just bleached all your organs. You've got, you know, spray bubbles or whatever, and you're breathing it in. That toxicity <laughs> just went in. For those of us who are poor detoxifiers, yeah. we just chemically bombed our whole body. So white vinegar type sprays. Uh, and it's an amazing, it's an amazing phenomenon when we start saying the issue is in the tissues, whether mm -hmm. it's inflammation, whether it's hormones being there or not being there. Once we understand what we saturate our body with, we understand what we have to work with because mm -hmm. all of this, your environment and your food is the only fuel your body knows what to do with. So if you give it live food, live body, okay? Dead food, mm -hmm. dead body. Synthetic okay. food, synthetic body, or it packages it away. What we want is low inflammation, good exchange and we want things to flow and we're here to help you make it flow and i love between the, the four of us really the answer is here's the data we want and let's have a conversation between you the expert in you and then a practitioner who's an expert in the, all the different options because there's not going to be one option that is applicable to everyone here, nor there's also a matter of opinion, right? There's, I'm sure there's a subset of people here who are like, I will absolutely never put an external hormone in my body. I want something from plants. And then the opposite, other people who are like, I don't want to bother with plants. Give me the straight up stuff. So make sure that whoever you are bringing in on your health journey is an expert in the options or knows experts in the option and is willing to listen to you. Because I think this is, as we work through the questions, um, I think that's gonna become a recurring theme. And so I really, really encourage people in the audience, know yourself, know your data, advocate for yourself and work with someone through these things because they will be able to lay out the options for you. And so I, I'm going to move on to our next question. And I really want to acknowledge there are a lot of questions in this chat and there's probably about half an hour left of us. So we're going to do our best to get through as many of these questions as I can. Um, but as you know, we just spent a beautiful 10 minutes on something that just the one question. So I don't think we'll get through our whole list. We're going to keep them recorded. We're going to bring these back up and we'll make sure that we continue to chip away at these, be it in our next session or next topic session. I just want to acknowledge there's a lot of questions and maybe not as much. All right. So I like this next question because I think it also speaks to, you know, not everyone in our audience tonight, while a majority are kind of in that peri or menopausal space, there are also some people on the younger end of the spectrum or different phases of their journey. And so um, let's offer them some time and thought. And I love that we're doing this all together because I love that these conversations in menopause, perimenopause are informing people for, you know, what can come in the greatness that can come, not in a doomsday sort of way. So this next question that I have, and I'm, I'm grateful it came up because I think there's a history around this of scaring females, women to a certain extent around fertility. So this question is, can you talk about AMH levels for 20 something year olds? So for awareness, and I'm going to allow, I'll allow um, someone in our panel to kind of speak to what AMH is, but historically it was something that was tested around fertility. And while it's still leveraged there, the conversation on it, its utility has changed a lot in medical research and clinical research in the past five, 10 years. I, I don't know the timeline on that, but the story has changed quite significantly in the past little bit. And so something that was used to scare women around fertility is now changing a little bit. So can I guess, can I ask our panelists who would like to speak to what AMH is and kind of its history of what it was and what it now is? Or anyone I'm seeing Dr. Steph maybe reach? I was going to say, I yeah. think this is a, a good Betty question as a functional medicine yeah. yeah. I, so first off, fertility is definitely not my specialty. I have, we helped a lot of women get pregnant, but it's not, you know, where I spend all of my day in and day out. So it's anti-malarian hormone. And so it fluctuates. And so when it's low, that is supposed to be the, the old kind of adage was, is when it's low, that shows low ovarian reserve. Meaning remember I was talking about the egg crate. It's like, you don't have very many eggs left in your egg crate. To be honest, that is a number one, this hormone, much like every other hormones, hormones have that's, you know, we have obviously our genetics that, that move them different directions. We also have counterbalancing things. And just like all other sex hormones, this hormone fluctuates throughout the month. 
So the time of day you have it, the day you have it, where you are in your cycle compared to the AMH level has high fluctuation. And I think I do agree. A lot of times if, if a woman starts having particularly abnormal periods or starts missing her periods, they, they kind of run to this as a, oh my gosh, well, maybe you have early, you know, ovarian failure, you know, and, and I think it's, I think it's speculative at best and I don't think it's accurate. Right. I think you'd have to, the only way you could look at that is you need to look at the sex hormones, the stress hormones. You, you need to cover the gamut before you tell somebody that that one marker is going to determine whether they have fertility or not. And I think the unfortunate part is it's being used a ton, particularly in the millennial population. I see young women in their mid twenties coming to me and they're like, I want to make sure I can get pregnant. And I'm like, sweetheart, if you quit worrying and go on vacation, <laughs> Chances are it will probably happen because you're stressing out. And it's because we have a lot of we have a lot of knowledge around it, but there's a lot of misinformation, I think, in the fertility space around this. And again, that's not my specialty. So, you know, but but I just think it's it's I think it's unnecessarily used as sort of a scare tactic. I am so glad to hear you say that because I was gonna be, I am like anti MA <laughs> I'm like, oh boy, you know, and I hate to be real dicey, but I, I've had, I can tell you almost 20 women who said, I, I, I've been to all these fertility specialists. I can't get pregnant. My levels are all this. And what do we do? Just like Lara said, we go back to the very beginning of those roots. What are you eating? Where are you sleeping? How are you living? Are your phones in your room? Do you have Wi-Fi turned all the time? Do you go from one box called house to one box called, you know, work to you drive in a box. You're, you're never outside. You're never outside the city. Um, all of them have been able to get pregnant with one or more pregnancies, but we didn't rely on that for any of them. We got back to diet. We got back to lifestyle. We got back to, you know, getting the cortisol levels down. You know, I've seen a couple PCOS questions and making sure those were in control, looking at what diet was they were on and, and maybe how we could clean that up a little and how we could supplement with foods that were estrogenic or progesteronic, you know, and, and literally, um, I, I think while it is valid in certain conditions, I think for what we're saying here and for a lot of women, young women's fertility, it is not the be all end all that I think some Western medicine are using it. So in my experience, and again, I'm not a fertility person. I'm more an autoimmune person, you know, <laughs> like liver inflammation and a gut person. I'm a celiac. So you want to talk celiacs, we'll talk. But uh, <laughs> um, I haven't found it at, yeah, I know we have so much in common. Betty, we have three it. of us here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I just, uh, I it's not as life or death as I think sometimes people come to us with it yeah. and, and really put the yeah. value in that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And thank you. Thank you for that robust answer that really hopefully starts to dispel some fears because I think we're very happy within healthcare and to scare people when we kind of forget the, the happy story behind it or the possibility behind it. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to usher into our next question here. And this question is from Alice and she's asking some specific advice. And, and I don't think I said this at the top of the hour, but make sure everyone's very mindful. You know, we've been um, very pointedly talking about the personalization of medicine, that everyone's journey is going to be different, that everyone's story is different and their preferences and their options are all going to be different. And the magic of where your healthcare plan and your healthcare guidance is truly between you and the practitioner. Um, so while we're going to kind of start addressing a few of these questions here, um, I'm seeing a lot around HRT and kind of cancer and all the fun things, right? Just make sure that you're aware that what we're offering here is thoughts and avenues to explore with your healthcare provider. We are not offering you very specific healthcare advice, okay? And that's because we cannot capture your whole health history. You've heard each of us talk about how long of an intake and how many questions we like to ask. That's This isn't the forum, so... With that said, um, Alice is asking a question in regards to her daughter, who is 16. Um, she experiences severe leg, um, severe leg muscle aches prior to the start of her period. They've tried Vitex, DIM, seed cycling. So all of these are more plant-based approaches to support cycle, to support detox, to support a few other things. Um, any suggestions for something to try or approaches? Um, perhaps maybe we have 
Uh, people go around and offer one or two thoughts from each of our practitioners here, because while there's many synergies between us, there's also going to be different perspectives. So um, maybe we'll start with Dr. Lara and we'll kind of reverse order as we had before. So Dr. Lara, Dr. Steph, and then Betty. Well, very quickly, understanding what is causing the leg cramps during or just before and during the period, the, the hormonal changes, that fluctuation of estrogen, progesterone levels, et cetera. Um, also inflammation, circulation issues, you know, all of these things. So what I would look at is um, what are her micronutrient levels? Magnesium is always very good for muscle relaxation. Okay, so look into foods and high in magnesium or even taking a magnesium supplement, but also never forget the basics. Hydration. Is she hydrated enough? Um, movement, stretching, yoga, you know, getting um, blood flow, oxygen to that, those um, parts of her body and the legs. Breath is so important. So doing that deep breathing and yoga and things like that get back to the basics, make sure that's covered first. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura, I love that. Steph? Okay, so my addition to that is calcium causes constriction, magnesium causes relaxation. So I would definitely get magnesium on board. Um, there are multiple salt forms of magnesium, like magnesium citrate, magnesium thionate, magnesium biglycinate. Um, so when you talk about muscles, um, very easy to do a citrate. I don't love citrate all the time simply because that can lose bowels as well, but I'm also, especially for 16 year olds and, and, and that I'd also look at omega threes. Um, so I'd look at cod liver oil, you know, is one of the greatest that I would do in there. And there's a new one that I really love called fatty 15. And Fatty 15 was actually developed uh, or discovered through a vet who was working with um, dolphins. And they found dolphins in Atlant the Atlantic Ocean were not responding as well as dolphins in the Pacific Ocean. And the difference in their brains for longevity, for their being able to have babies, for uh, stress levels, was the ones that were eating a certain algae in the Pacific Ocean had this additional fatty acid and got rid of a lot of problems. I've actually started taking it myself and I've been amazed at sleep and cramps and things. So look up fatty 15, cod liver oil and magnesium would be my next steps that I would add. Betty? Okay, I full wholeheartedly agree with everybody so far. <laughs> the other thing I think about too is one of the things that causes uterine contraction, and it also makes your bowels loose, right? My, IBS was my entire dissertation. You go to the bathroom because of prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are what causes the uterine contraction, but they're part of the pain pathway, right? So joint pain, muscle pain, aches and pains have a prostaglandin component. So one of the things that you can also use is, is GLA, gamma linolenic acid from evening primrose oil. And you can take a bunch of it. You can take you know a couple thousand, the days leading up to your period, just, I'm like, if you get cramps, pop it until they stop, <laughs> right? Because it's, because it may be that pain pathway. The other thing is she may still be growing. And I'm not so sure that there isn't something with growth plate, growth plate activity at the bones, like your bones ache when you're younger, when the period's getting started. So there could be a little bit of that too. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love these answers. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one more question from our box and quite literally it's just in sequential order i'm not cherry picking any of these questions but i'm grateful that the first few are quite diverse um for those whose questions are not going to be answered please i really encourage you we don't want to neglect them or ignore them please join the facebook group that beth within the chat posted we'll ask beth to post that link again and if you've asked us a question please pop it in there and we will we will be answering them there as well. We don't want this neglected. You've offered us your time, your thoughts. We've offered this safe space for both the, the owies and the curiosities and the joys of it all. So we'll make sure we get those answered. And in parallel to that, in that Facebook group, when we create the schedule of um, this beautiful collection of ladies coming together, um, 
We'll definitely post that schedule there as well, as well as you'll get emailed and all the other fun things. So you'll be kept in the loop. But so if we're not getting to your question, please do post it in the Facebook group because we want to keep in touch. We want to ensure that we're supporting and offering best answers. Because if you haven't read in between the lines yet, this is this is between the four of us, something we're so impassioned about and give generously towards because it's important. Learning to advocate for health and supporting female women's health is really important to the four of us. Um, so our last question that we're at least we're going to be able to get to today uh, is from Deanna, Dana, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, are there genome or genetic markers that are aligned with a PCOS diagnosis? So I'm going to toss this to the ladies. First, what I'll ask you to do is someone just to open up with what exactly PCOS is, emphasis on the S of that and what, what doctors mean when they utter S. Um, and then maybe some thoughts around some of the genomic markers. With, with mindfulness, I'm just going to set the stage. There is not one gene that says, yes, you will or will not. There is not a diagnostic gene for this. There are certain patterns that we see within genes, amongst other things, and that will kind of play into the fact that we're going to emphasize what the S stands for. Um, so who would like to take a go at defining what this catch-all diagnosis of PCOS is? <laughs> Laura? Sure. Well, okay. First of all, PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. And anytime you hear syndrome, it is a catch-all of symptoms that have been classified, you know, grouped together for a particular diagnosis. So it, there is that range. Um, and this is a common condition that does affect hormones um, in women in their childbearing years. Oftentimes, uh, most women with PCOS produce excessive amounts of androgens. Um, these are the male sex hormones. But like I had said, testosterone, that's an androgen. Women have a, a lot of it, um, you know, like I had mentioned, when you actually normalize everything. Um, so the thing is, is we often see that more so for androgen dominant women. Um, it, the tendencies are more so for that particular um, uh, profile. But I do have to say, I personally am estrogen dominant with uh, you know risk of estrogen toxicity. Yet when I was in my 20s, I was diagnosed with PCOS. So I fall outside of that typical, oh, well, this is what you would think. You know, and and that that happened. Um, you know, so yeah, it's it is the syndrome, and there's a lot of different uh, things that play into that particular diagnosis. Um, yeah. So that's more so the genetic aspect of it. But I want to give a few minutes to each of my colleagues here to give their information as well. Yeah, Steph, Betty, thoughts. See stuff well, I'll just tell you that a lot of my PCOS um, clients have a lot of seed oils in their diets. So mm -hmm. I want you to be real careful about, we were just talking about those inflammatory pathways and the gut head issues. It, it's going to be really important that, and, and people don't always want to hear this, but as a celiac, as somebody who had cervical cancer, as somebody who was told you're going to have to be on se severely restricted diet. And I went on basically eggs and spinach for breakfast, lettuce and chicken for lunch and beef and broccoli for two years, no condiments, no fruit, no, you know, and I took 143 pills a day. It was because I was back in the dark ages and we didn't have all this testing <laughs> and we didn't have combination products. But, but what we find is that rapid inflammation in the body then spins things even more out of control. Um, in addition to that, the controversy of we didn't have all of the handheld computers and the phones that we were constantly on for bombarding and the EMFs, all the computers and every home, all of that causes hormonal disruption and will add to. So it's going to get back to that cleaning up your diet, cleaning up your environment, um, working with someone who's willing to work with you and really listen to you 
so that we can you know, measure and see how are you responding. Um, it is not a death sentence. It is not a you'll never have kids. I mean, I mean, the beautiful thing is, yeah, hey, there. So Lara has two. I've got several who, who've gotten it under control. But they had a lot of aha moments when we go through that detailed history and really talk about what are you putting in? What has your lifestyle been? What kind of a timeline do you want to get on to get pregnant if you want to have that or get your hormones under control? And it may require some very specific supplementation, you know, right away so that that, that can be balanced because it is a, obviously an imbalance. Betty? Yeah, I I mean, I second every, everything everybody said. So, you know, there's there are individuals who have some genetic, not even so much sex hormones, but when you look at polycystic ovarian syndrome, when somebody, so the egg doesn't pop out, everybody, that's basically the problem is the egg gets ready and never comes out. <laughs> so if you were to look at your egg carton, it's, it's swelling. That usually starts to occur when we hit our puberty, right? And it's an interaction in the classic sense. It's an interaction between metabolic hormones, insulin control, blood sugar control, and the onset of periods and estrogen. And essentially what happens is you don't get enough variation in the luteinizing hormone, which is the coach that tells the ovaries to kind of get ready and shoot the egg out. And then you have an overall effect that the estrogen stays somewhat stable. It doesn't pop up and down and progesterone never climbs. So that's your classic PCOS, right? Which often has an androgen do dominant state, but it doesn't have to be. And guess what? You can lean into that continuum just because you might have gained some weight so they have pseudo PCOS. You can look that up online, you know, where you gain some weight and maybe your metabolic changes and blood sugar control can start to mess with your sex hormones. But the reality is, is if it's a metabolic thing, we have to remember these hormones are a symphony. We have to play with them together. So we may need to clean up the diet, really dial in on insulin sensitivity, the right kind of exercise and all those other things and support your body's natural ability to modulate those hormones right? Because you can obviously get pregnant. You can obviously control that. And you, and there's probably some downstream effects, particularly from an estrogen and, and testosterone metabolism standpoint that we see in the DNA. We can also manipulate. Now, what's get, what gets interesting is when women get into menopause and they've been on this continuum, all women generally, when we go through menopause and we make less estrogen because the instructions are off now because the ovaries have run out of eggs, we become slightly androgen dominant anyway, right? As women, if we're not supplementing, we're not putting in hormones. So those effects on a woman may become more obvious, like hair loss, every, peach fuzz. Stephanie, do you <laughs> get the peach? I'm like, oh my God, what happened to the cheese? I effect? have one or two oh, that yeah. I get like these wires that come out. And, I <laughs> those. and overnight, I'm a Kansas I hairless. So fortunately I got that, but I got one or two that it's like, <laughs> I, I tell my husband, this is, weeks. I tell my husband, you know how you can see those things in the light in the car? Oh, and yeah. I, I can't see it in the bathroom. I'm like, I swear to God, if you see that and you don't tell me, you're in trouble. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to the corner. <laughs> it came out. So, I but plus, if enough, I didn't get damaged with the follicle, thank goodness. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we get a little more of that anyway. So, but this is 100% manageable, right? And and manipulatable. We just have to get mm -hmm. in there and do it. We got to understand that diet lifestyle absolutely play a role. It's not just playing with hormones, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's truly, you know, having someone who cares about the current state of you really digging in is this truly a PCOS or is this something masquerading in because the treatment and the support of both of those right the right diagnosis the right signs the right symptoms echoing what these lovely ladies have been talking about that's where the magic starts right that's that's the first step really understanding where you're at and so I think as as we close our time together I I thank the ladies before me so tenderly for sharing their experiences, sharing a little bit about themselves. I'm so grateful that we as women get to be storytellers, both of our personal journeys and then the journey uh, we understand to be women within the healthcare space to the end of ensuring others understand their own story better so they can offer that story to their healthcare provider. And there can be that beautiful relationship that enables both better understanding of self and then navigating where you want self to go, where you want your health picture to go, how you want to be supporting that. So 
from all of us here, I'm, I'm going to offer kind of a collective adieu. Um, I'm so very grateful to the women before me. Thank you so very much for joining. Thank you so very much to everyone within the audience. Thank you for coming out here. Thank you to the women, to, to the men, to everyone, to all the people who decided that this was important and they wanted to participate both for their benefit and the benefit of the people in their world. Um, we at the DNA company want to be alongside you in this journey. So we're committing to, um, if your question wasn't answered today, please jump into the Facebook group. We will um, answer it there. We'll also post within that group when the next sessions are going to be, because I've, I've uh, voluntold with permission, <laughs> we're all going to be back and we will all be back. Um, and so we'll make sure that we all keep together and we can kind of create a space where it's safe for the more tricky, scary pieces, but also the funny pieces, you know, the little things that stick out and the joyful pieces, right? Because I think we pathologize this journey as a woman in ways that isn't fair. And there's so much dancing and joy and laughter to be had along the way, especially when we we hold hands together and, and laugh <laughs> at, at the journeys that we undertake. So... Again, thank you to our brilliant, wonderful panelists. Your lives and your practices are very busy, so we value the time you've offered us. We uh, extend our gratitude to the audience for holding space with us, and we're going to see everyone probably in four or five, six weeks, whenever the powers that be, the voices of God, decide that we're going to be collecting back together <laughs> those that control the calendar. So thank everyone so very much, and we will see you next time. Au revoir.